welcome to the Fights That Made Me podcast with myself, Umar Ahmed. I'm joined by Peter McDonough today. Uh, thank you very much for your time at your beautiful gym here in central London, Peter. Yeah, I mean, they say history is a mystery. All you've got to do is look at the wall and you can see all the champions from 1913 that Fisher Boxing Club has produced. One uh, of the latest champions was uh, Lloyd Unigan. Um, for me, still probably the best win ever abroad in America against Don Curry. We're sorry we've lost the man who was the Alex Ferguson of amateur boxing. There's no doubt about it, Steve Weiser. 58 years in the gym. Um, and that was a hard time when we lost him. So I felt I had to come back to where my home is. And uh, listen, I'm not going to fill his shoes, but if I can tie his shoelaces, that'd be good enough for me. Well, that's uh, the career that's hopefully uh, you're going to succeed in and, and you know, fulfill your dreams in. But let's talk about the career that's made you in terms of in the ring. Um, so yeah, I'd like to start off, if I can, with um, people's professional debuts. I don't want you to go too much into the fight, etc. but just making your professional debut, Peter. Just talk to me about that. That was back in 2002. Yeah, um, I fought uh, Alf Mitu. I don't know if you remember him. Uh, he, was, he was like a, he was a character, a knobby knobs fighter. Um, and when we talk about journeyman um, now, I think it's a very weak word in the sense of um, journeymen years ago were journeymen. They taught you how to fight, bring you along. Um, you know, uh, you know, they'd catch you with a couple of shots, but they knew they was there to survive. And they, but they could fight. You know, all had amateur uh, backgrounds themselves. And uh, I always remember uh, going to the Elephant at Castle on my debut. Um, it was a buzz coming out. You never forget your debut, they say. And uh, it was on a Eugene Maloney show Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was packed in Bermondsey. You know, home, home from my home sort of thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it, it was brilliant. It was. Uh, how can I say it? It's, I don't know, I don't know, just, there's nothing like your debut, there's nothing like your debut, uh, professional or amateur, I can still remember my amateur uh, debut, which was 37 years ago, over 37 years ago, um, and like I say, uh, I'll tell you what made, I'll tell you what I think made me, we're talking about debuts now, even amateur or professional, what made me was, when I first was amateur, six, uh, eight fights before I got a win, and uh, after I got that win, it gave me that confidence, um, you know, and it helped me in life as well, straight away from that point. And like I say, I've had more trainers in JD Sports, but only ever had one teacher, and that was Steve Weiser. Um, and like I say, teacher in the ring, out of the ring, you know, respect, um, punctuality, and I had, I, had to, I had to become a man in life. And uh, he's helped me, definitely helped me through that life. Um, and like I say, thanks to him, you know, Okay, well, let's fast forward um, a few years to 2005. Uh, a win, decision win over Anthony Christopher. Yeah. Um, I know you've got a, a story to tell with that fight as well. But yeah, so share that story with me and also about the fight itself, please. Well, it's funny. Uh, I, I, I'd gone out to Ireland. Um, I flew back to Ireland for a press conference to fight Michael Gomez um, to sign contracts. And uh, at the airport, I uh, met a funny man, Yuri Geller. And uh, I said, can you wish me luck for the fight against Gomez? He said, you don't need luck, you're going to win. Uh, we exchanged numbers. We'll go on to that in a minute. But uh, the only reason I just put that in is because I was already in contract to fight Michael Gomez. Um, I was sitting in a McDonald's in Epsom. Um, just got a Big Mac, to be honest with you. Uh, and I literally took my first bite out of the Big Mac and I got a phone call off Frank Maloney. Now Kelly Maloney. He's still Frank Maloney to me. But uh, yeah... So um, he said, look, Sky are going to pull this show tonight, right? If we can't get another fight on this show, will you fight? I didn't even say how much money am I getting, who am I fighting? I put the phone down, finished my Big Mac and made my way to the York Hall. I was stuck in traffic on the M25 for about three hours. I got to the York Hall, I said to him, who am I fighting? And he said, oh, we're bringing someone up from Wales, uh, Anthony Christopher. I said, no problem. So... Gloves on, uh, got in there and uh, boxed, live on Sky. Let's not forget, I was in contract with Gomez. All of a sudden, I, I got the fight, I come home. I didn't even tell my missus I had a fight. I just come home with a lump of money, got the win, and then I got a phone call off Brian Peters in Ireland. said, what are you doing? You're in contract, you can't do things like that. I said, what does it matter? I won, didn't I? He said, yeah, but if you'd have got injured, you know, this fight wouldn't have happened with Gomez. And... Uh, yeah, I got the win and uh, 
that's really that to that fire. But I think that's quite an interesting story that literally, look, at the end of the day, right, if you sign a contract to turn professional, you're a professional fighter. Yeah, you sign to fight. So you should always be ready. And I was not always ready physically, but I was always ready mentally because I'm a fighter with inside. With inside myself, I'm a fighter. I know I am. And uh, that's not blowing my own trumpet. That is what I am. You know, I never ever asked how much money I was getting, um, how many rounds it was. It was, I'm going to fight. You know, not till the later part of my career that, you know, I sort of took my time and I realised I probably grew up a little bit as I got older and more mature. Um, and I had a, as they say, it ain't how you start, it's how you finish. And I had a 13 fight unbeaten streak when I finished. So what was the, the gap between you getting that call um, from Maloney and then jumping in the ring? How many hours? Uh, it was no longer than four hours. Oh, I don't no... think I've ever heard of that before. No, I'm, I'm probably one of the only fighters as well that's done two championship fights back to back in a week. I don't know how many people have done that. So I defended the Irish title and then fought for the Southern area a week later or uh, uh, vice versa, it was the other way around. So, um, I know you talk about, I've gone back off the subject and I always try and put, not put something else in, but other things sort of come to my mind. Maybe the ADHD uh, causes that. Um, shout out to anyone who's got ADHD and they understand where I come from because I've I got on enough subjects. Um, but the fight that made me, the fight that broke me was Michael Gomez. It broke me. And this is a, obviously the second fight we're going to talk about. Um, well, just to give some context, that was in 2006 yep. um, in Dublin at the National Stadium. It's a big occasion. Um, go on, what were you saying about Michael Gomez's fight? You know what? I turned professional um, and I boxed since the age of, in this club, since the age of six, I was in the club. And did I really want to be a boxer? Now, this is a crazy question as well. Did I want to be a boxer? I don't know. I had so much going on at home. Um, you know, I was getting abuse at home by my mum. I was getting abuse at school, as a, you know, as you know, as as a kid being bullied. Irish, speaking Irish. I spoke fluent Gaelic when I first came to the Bermondsey. Obviously, I was a Cockney after six months, as you can hear in my accent. Um, but uh, I used it as a self-arming tool, and it's interesting because even when I turned professional, it was sort of like I just wanted to get away from what was really going on outside. And this was what like my bubble. Boxing was like my bubble, and. Uh, I got the phone call for the Gomez fight and the Gomez fight meant so much to me. And I'll tell you why it meant so much to me. I've got shivers going down my back now. You know, me, it was for me dad because it was an Irish title and I'll be honest with you, that's the only fight I ever trained for in my life, yeah, that was, uh, what do you call it? That I, tra look, honestly, I had 12 weeks camp and I trained my life for that fight. And uh, to have the national anthem, I have the Irish flag. I just knew it would make my dad so proud. Um, I flew over on a private jet with Yuri Geller. Um, there was a man called Patrick Rugger, God rest his soul. Uh, he committed suicide in 2008 uh, when the Celtic Tiger went down. Um, it was surreal because I flew over on a private jet. And I always remember Yuri Geller saying to me, look, this is how the real live. This is how the, you're living like David Beckham now. Three days before it, uh, Bill Clinton was on the same plane. Like... He got flown back to Ireland. Patrick Rocket used to look after him. So, opportunity in boxing. I've had beautiful opportunities. I've met some amazing people. Um, so I flew back for the Gomez fight. I sat down. This was on the uh, this was on the day before, and they put these. I don't know. It's funny how it all works out. But they put these slips on the table, betting slips, and they said 125 to one. And I turned around and said, "You won't give a free a free Ulster." Uh, three-legged uh, all stat right, at that sort of odds. And I thought, I am going to smash you to bits. And not only was I physically ready, I was mentally ready. And to any young fighter out there now, or, you know, boxing in general, let's forget conditioning. Let's forget how fit you can become. It's all about the mind. 90% of it is in your mind and in your brain. Because let me tell you, I've took fights at three days' notice, four, four weeks' notice, uh, four, uh, four, four days' notice, and won them fights because I'm mentally right. I've trained hard for six weeks, and my mind ain't been right, so I've lost the fights. But the Gomez fight, um, there was something different there. There was, there was something I wanted to win. I wanted to be this champion, Irish champion. As soon as that was done... 
um, I fulfilled my dreams. Every dream that I had and aspirations I had in boxing. And now you're going to ask me, how did I go on for so long after that? Because I kept walking away from boxing. All the time I was walking away. And something had happened in my life. I'd get sidetracked and I'd say, I've got to go back in the gym. I've got to start training again. I think... I know Tyson talks about it all the time, about mental health, and I don't, I don't like to talk too much about depression and this and that, because I'm, I'm one of them people, I think I've just dealt with things, and I know I've suffered, I've, I've obviously suffered somewhere along, but I don't, I don't, I just don't like throwing the word out there too much, because I think it's very, very overused and oversold, and I think people just want to listen to stories of people, when and then you look at someone who has done it and done well with it, and you think, oh, you're yeah, all right, mate, you're just saying that, because it just gives you a little bit more of a selling pattern, but... That's what I used it for. So instead of self-harming, going out drinking and going crazy, I'd come to the boxing gym and come back in and start training. So it was, it was basically like a trap. It was basically like a trap for me. Um, so I know you're going to ask me another question, but I'm going to go on to another. On. No, yeah, no, because I'm going on to the subject now when the biggest thing, again, that broke me. Um, like I say, boxing for me was a self-harming tool, but... In 2009, um, we only found out in 2018 when I collapsed with a brain tumour. But in 2009, I had a tumour which was growing within my brain. Um, but it was obviously missed. And uh, so since 2009, I was fighting with a brain tumour. So I was fighting with a secret that I didn't even know. And uh, in 2018, when we found out, 2009, I think it was, sorry, we found out um, that... I had a checked brain tumour. That's when everything just hit the floor. Just went to pieces. Um, like I say, I hated boxing. Um, I felt, I just felt, I don't know. I, 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 the thing I loved, I hated the most. And uh, I just come away from it. And um, yeah, that was, that was, that was, when you say the fight that made me, that was the fight that made me when I come through my brain tumour. Um, but it was going to be hard again due to I never had boxing anymore. I lost boxing. Do you get what I mean? So uh, let's not forget, four days later, my brother hung himself and committed suicide. So uh, yeah, this ain't you know this ain't a story. This is my life, and I know we've gone right off the subject here, but you know just how I feel. And this is clearly the toughest fight of your life. Yeah, that period. Without a doubt, without a doubt, um, I go back in in two weeks' time um, to have another operation. It has to be on Halloween. Um, I'm not too happy. I'm upset, really, because that's my busiest day of the year for scaring the kids. <laughs> so, uh, nah, listen, you've just got to be positive and, you, and you've got to enjoy it. But as much as I talk about all them stories, as you know, in my book, like, you do talk about all them stories, but I always try and make a positive out of a negative. Do you know what I mean? Everything I want, I want to be a positive out of a negative. So, let's... I, 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 I said boxing was a negative at that point in my life when I found out about the brain tumour. How can it be a negative? That's the positive that's got me through my whole life. You know, that's, that, that is the positive that's got me through my whole life and kept me... It's the only thing that I had rules for. You know, it's the only thing that kept rules when I went to jail. It's the only thing that kept me, do you know what I mean, on the straight and narrow. Do you know what I mean? So it's... Um, but, uh, yeah, even... I mean, you're talking about the fights that made me, again, with the singleton fight. You know, when I fought Shane Singleton, you know, was that 2000 and... 2017, points went over Singleton. 2017, I mean, we sat at the press conference before that fight, again, underdog, you know, 40 years old nearly. Um, he was 27, so he said to me, you're an old man, I'm only 27. I said, yeah, you're 13 years younger, you're 13 years dumber. You know what I mean? You know, he sat there and said he can do pull-ups, he can do sprints, he can do this, he can do... I said, let me tell you something, this is not a race. I said, this is a fight. And I said, I'm going to be too clever for you. Um, and like I say, that, that was a big fight. It was 27 and one. He, you know, he had, he had a record. As I say, records are for DJs. You know what I mean? You know, and uh, like I say, um, even in that fight, it was, I wanted to win that fight. Another fight I wanted to win. Do you know what? I'm not saying I ever went in there to lose, but when I wanted to win a fight, I was winning them fights. Do you get what I mean? Like, how could I lose to the likes of Curtis Woodass? You know, I said, the only gloves you should be wearing is goalkeeper gloves. You know what I mean? And that's the truth. But listen, I'm respecting these, but you know, I've got respect for these people. I'm, I'm saying the, the quotes I said when I, was, when I was in it. I mean, but another thing with the, with the uh, sorry, with the Singleton fight, um, I was told, I'm not going to mention no names, I'm not a grass, but I was told just before 
the press conference, this fight needs selling, yeah? Do something, right? And that's one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done in boxing. You know, that weren't me. I was a fighter, mate, a real fighter, not pushing people and all that. You know, drunk the Guinness after the weigh-in, um, which, till today, I still can't understand how the British boxing board out of control, not the British boxing board of control, I had an eight-month ban for pushing someone. How can I get an eight-month ban when you've got other people throwing tables up in the air and all that? Why do you think that was? Because I'm Irish. Because I'm Irish. Why did I never get a shot at the British title? How did I never get a shot at the British title? I beat Lee Purdy, British champion. Yeah? I, I, bet, I, beat, I beat about five or six British champions and never ever even got a shot at the British title. You know? I definitely think... I don't know what it was, but they definitely had something against me. And uh, I don't know why, because... I was one of them people that kept boxing going, you know. I was always in there. I'll take, I'll take a fight at short notice. Like I say, I was never a journeyman because I never got in there to lose. I always believed I could win, yeah. But when I did get myself up for a fight and I was right for a fight, I believe, you know, I was ready to, you know, I, I, could, I could have beat anyone on my night, which I proved against Michael Gomez. Let's not forget he was shot, he was finished, they said. Two years later, he dropped Khan to us. So, you know, he never even, you know, done nothing with me, shook me nothing. But I was mentally in the right place. When I was mentally in the right place, you know, and as I, as I proved towards the end of my career, when I was finally looked after, I was finally looked after, and I let other people take control to a degree. But I'll tell you another thing I'll say to every fighter out there, is we can only take care of ourselves. And I've become a world champion, and I'll tell you why I've become a world champion. My face is not smashed to pieces, and I can put a sentence together. And that's what, how hey, you become a world champion. Because for me, a world title's worth nothing if you get out of boxing and you're smashed to pieces and you're injured, you know? So um, I, was, I was on the WBC world title belt by Mauricio Solomon um, through what I've been through and all that. Like I say, I won a world champion in the ring. You know, if me nan had balls, it'd be me granddad. So, but I, I'm, I'm honest in what I say, but I do believe I've been through a lot of, stuff within, within boxing, let's forget life, within boxing in general. Um, no, I sit there and speak, I speak to people, type of people say, you become a good trainer, you repeat, because of this and because of that, and you had 58 pro fights and you had loads of amateur fights. I said, let me tell you something, the reason why I become a good trainer is because I travelled the world as a sparring partner for 12 years, and I learnt so much within that 12 years, being around the best coach in the world, being around Floyd Mayweather, being around Canelo, being around Goody Patronelli, who trained Marvin Agler. So, and I took everything in. I was a gym rat. I used to sit in the gym. Even if I, was, if I was sparring, I'd sit in the gym from the morning to the night. Not only will I be watching what's going on in the, in the ring, I'll be watching what they're doing, the managers in the offices, because a lot of the time in the olden days, there'd be offices at the end, and real managers you'd have watching the fighter, because you should see the progress in what your fighter's doing. So now, I'm going to install that, and I'm going to take that forward with me. You know, um, like I say, boxing is in a, in a, in a spot at the moment um, and it's not down to anyone really, but what people have got to realise is people are trying to get boxing out. We've got to get them so they've got a bigger following. So we're, it's, like, it's not influencer boxing. Listen, let me tell you something. We're living in a life now where everything's fake. It's not real, yeah? The problem is when you look at all these kids on the wall and we look at all the champions or national amateur champions, right? You turn around and go, they've got a CV, so why are they not getting paid? Why are they not getting exposure? And I'll tell you why. We're getting thoroughbreds against donkeys in professional boxing. We need thoroughbred against thoroughbred. Now, you're a football fan. I know you're a football fan. Now, Chelsea, right? They're playing Man United. It's going to be sold out, yeah? If they play Scunthorpe, yeah, and hammer Scunthorpe 6-0, yeah, and they go, yeah, and then next week we're going to be fighting, we're going to be playing Scunthorpe again or another team like Scunthorpe, yeah? Play this ain't going to sell. It's common sense. It's not, it doesn't take much working out. And then we get answers from people saying, fighters don't want the fights, trainers don't want the fights. I'll tell you why trainers don't want the fights, firstly, because they want to validate their self. Because they are false and they are blaggers and they're cheerleaders, they don't want to have the confidence to put their fight on somebody else. It's not about safety first. It should be about safety first, but it's not. It's about their own ego. So fighters, I'll use a prime example. Don't like dropping names, but I'm gonna, right? I'll use a prime example. Dennis McCann, 
two years ago, I said, Dennis, Dennis, make a change, right? I like Dennis, he's a lovely kid, right? And he, I always remember his debut at the Albert Hall when he turned around and said to me, Peter, he said, uh, he said oh, I used to love you, as you were one of my favourite fighters when I was little, when I was young. I thought, Jesus Christ, are you boxing? And he says, my debut. I said, you look about 12. So you look young. And uh, do you know what happens with these fighters? They tread water for too long. He was beating better people in the amateurs. And what happens is you tread water for so long, you start believing your own hype, and then when you get in there with someone that's actually got a proper heartbeat, you know, you're, you're going to get beat. And that's the truth of it. And I, this is what I think is wrong with boxing. If you have 13 fights and a great career, that's enough. You don't need to have 45 fights. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, and I think fighters need to be moved along. Small steps, but the right way. You know what I mean? Just going back to that uh, Singleton fight, just yeah. talk to me about the fight itself and how, how it panned out, Peter. Yeah, like I, I played him, I played him, didn't I? Because I told him, yeah, I'm going to get in there, I'm going to stand with you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But I just used my brain when I got in there, you know? With the brain tumour. But uh, yeah, so I used my brain and uh, just boxed him. Just used me, used my feet, used my hands. I was always told from the first day I walked in this gym. And do you know what? I'll never forget, and I'll be honest with you, and this is no disrespect to anyone I've, anyone I've worked with, and they've all given me loads of time. But I always went back to what Steve Weiser said. Your feet get you into trouble and your feet get you out of trouble. So it's all about using your feet. Your feet are your defence. As you can see with the likes of Floyd Mayweather, it's all about his feet. Um, and uh, yeah, even when I used to go back to the corner and you know, people used to say to me, trainers, and they used to say to me, oh, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. But in my head, I thought, that ain't going to work. It was like I was one step ahead of what they were saying. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, maybe uh, sometimes I didn't listen. But one thing I know I listened to is I never took too many shots. Uh, you know, everyone said I was in, always in exciting fights. But if you watch the fights properly, I wasn't even getting it, you know? I was either riding the shots, catching the shots, or do you know what I mean? So, but like I, like I say, you know, I know it was, it was just, like I say, it was, was, I, was I in boxing to win more titles? I don't think I was. I think I was in there just to deal with what was going on in life. And every time something was hard in life, I would deal with it. So, hence why I'm back here in the boxing ring now. And uh, I will be 10 times a trainer Teacher, not trainer, teacher of the fighter I was. I know I will, because not, I've done this wrong. I, again, I don't have to stand there and say to people, ah, oh, I've done this, and I don't, oh yeah, but you've been there. I disagree with it if people have been there, right? Ben Davison never had that much experience as an amateur, right? But I rate him as a coach. And, and he under, do you know why he understands boxing? He understands boxing. And do you know what? This is what I don't understand, Omar, right? This is what I don't understand. He's... How can you go with someone, yeah, and after six months, say they're the greatest trainer in the world, yeah, when you've had some old geezer in the gym or a young man like myself bring you through from nothing, the foundations and the fundamentals, the most important part of boxing, yeah, and then turn around and say, oh, yeah, he's the greatest trainer I've ever, ever had. Don't even know him. After six months, you get to know him. So what the plan is to do here is bring the fighters through um, and keep them with us, and uh, keep, them, keep them first, safety first, and look after them, look after the fighters. And like I say, we don't need to run to promoters asking, can we work with your fight, can we do your fight? They come to us because we're going to produce champions. And uh, like I say, if there's promoters out there that think the same way as I do, not only are we going to have good fighters, but boxing's going to become great again. And that's, that's the plan, what I want to do, you know? Listen, Peter McDonough, thank you very much about uh, talking about the, the fights that made you and hopefully these kids in the gym um, down here at this prestigious gym, you can make a lot of their careers as well or help make their careers. Uh, Peter, just before we close up on this podcast, um, I'd like to ask a wildcard question. So as an ex-fight yourself, if you could share the ring with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Uh... Interesting. That's an odd question. It's an odd question. Um, Roberto Duran, probably. How comes? Because he, he, he was my hero. Um, like I say, there was no bigger hero than Steve Weiser to me. Um, and if I could share the ring with him again, and we could bring him back, that would be the most beautiful thing. But uh, Roberto Duran, without a doubt, um, because it wasn't tough. He was intelligent. And it's funny because I was sitting on a top table with Marvin Agler and uh, someone asked that question. And as Marvin went to answer it, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, stop there. 
I said, let me say something, please, Marvin. And uh, obviously, because I met Marvin, I was with Marvin in, uh, in, Bro in Brockton, in uh, Boston, with Goody. And uh, anyways, I said, uh, listen, he weren't tough. I said, he was intelligent. I said, he used to ride the shots. So I learned, I learned a lot, watched a lot of him. Um, but I'll tell you another thing I'll say, though, as well. And I'll stop. <laughs> but I'll tell you another thing I'll say. Um, it's not, don't go and watch a fighter and try and be like that fighter. Be yourself. And another thing I'll say is this. I'm going to tell you something now. I've had so much camera time. I don't need camera time, like on TV and all that business. It's about the fighter. And guess what? Champions are, uh, champions are born. I don't believe they're made. I think something, someone's got to have something when they walk through them doors. I don't care how good a teacher you are. You've got to have something when you walk through them doors. There's got to be desire. You know, there's got to be a big art there. There's got to be a big pair of balls there, in my opinion. You, can, you need something to work with. And uh, I think uh, trainers should take a step back sometimes and let the fighter do the talking. Because at the end of the day, you can only take the, take the uh, horse to water. You can't make him drink it. So great fighters make great tra trainers. Very simple. Good fighters make good trainers. Mediocre fighters don't make a trainer, in my opinion. Okay, Peter, thank you very much for your time. Uh, please like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Nice one.